June 29th, 2016, our lives changed forever. A virulent man-made virus had been mysteriously released into the population, mutating the infected into ravenous flesh-eating zombies. The outbreak had claimed untold lives, but somehow my wife and I had managed to survive. We escaped the carnage of the cities by driving deep into the countryside, hoping to find relative safety at her parents' farm. When we arrived, we were relieved, not only to find her parents still alive, but with the help of the locals, they had managed to fortify the farm. The granary held enough grain to feed us for months, and we had plenty of ammunition. It seemed as though we could survive here almost indefinitely. All too soon, we realized things weren't that simple. With no one working at the local sewage treatment plant, filth had found its way into our drinking water. A disease we had all but forgotten about came back to haunt us. Cholera. Without antibiotics to treat the infection, people grew weaker and weaker, and finally died. It was clear that if someone didn't go and find some medicine soon, we'd all be wiped out within a month. Those still healthy enough to hold a gun decided to draw straws. Mine was the shortest. Having been chosen for the mission into town, I wasted no time and started preparing immediately. I realized that even decisions that seemed unimportant at the time could make the difference between life and death later on. With that in mind, I headed to my father-in-law's wardrobe and started to think about what I should wear. I chose to wear the old man's combat fatigues. I hoped it would make me much harder to spot. I knew that I was heading straight into a meat grinder. Zombies still wandered the streets, devouring any living thing that crossed their path. I knew that confrontation with the infected was inevitable, and so after I got dressed, I headed straight for the armory. I took the shotgun, realizing it was easy to use and powerful at both close and medium range. Having armed myself, I grabbed a rucksack to carry some additional supplies. It was imperative that I traveled light so I could complete my mission as quickly as possible. My fellow survivors were counting on me getting back with antibiotics as soon as possible, and the risk of being unable to outrun the infected was one I wasn't willing to take. I took the longest, strongest rope I could find. I had no idea what I might be getting myself into, and a rope might come in handy. I was almost ready to leave the safety of the compound. For the first time since arriving, I felt truly afraid. I knew that I may never return from this mission, but if I didn't go, what little remained of my family would be wiped out. I knew my wife was sick, and unless I got her the medicine soon, after all we'd been through, I couldn't let it end like this. I went back inside the house, climbed the stairs to our bedroom and slowly pushed open the door. My wife lay asleep in bed. She was pale and her body dripped with sweat. She had had a fever for some time and I knew that without medicine she wouldn't last much longer. I leant over and kissed her gently on the forehead whispered goodbye my love and then silently left the room. As I walked back down the stairs I swore to myself that I would find the antibiotics she needed or die trying. I took a deep breath and stepped out of the compound into the wasteland beyond. I heard the gate swinging closed followed by the unmistakable sound of it being securely locked behind me. I started walking and didn't look back. As I began my journey, I realized that I had quite a way to go, and I considered finding alternative transportation. I had to walk quite
quite a while before I eventually spotted an old and slightly rusty bicycle sticking out of a hedgerow. It wasn't in very good shape, but it was about rideable, and still a hell of a lot quicker than walking. Unfortunately, just before I reached the outskirts of town, the chain snapped. I would have to continue on foot, but at least I saved myself a lot of time and effort. After a couple of hours, I eventually came to the outskirts of town. The place had been pretty run down even before the outbreak, and I had struggled to imagine it being any worse than I remembered. I was wrong. Once the streets had been the home of petty gangs and prostitutes, but now they were littered with decaying, half-eaten corpses. The air was thick with flies, and maggots crawled and squirmed among the bodies. I took a moment to regain my composure, and then pressed on, trying not to notice what I was standing on. As I turned the corner, I saw another man standing some distance down the road. I had no idea if it was a survivor like myself, or one of the infected. I couldn't be sure if the man was still human or not, and I didn't want to waste ammo unnecessarily. There were plenty of cars and other debris between us, so I decided to carefully sneak past him instead. He didn't seem to notice me. Having dealt with the situation, I continued on down the street towards a small chemist. To my relief and surprise, the building didn't show any outward signs of having been looted. The door was closed and the glass window was still intact. I glanced around to make sure there were no infected nearby, and then tried the door. It was locked. perfectly good window I could use. Using my gun as a club, I smashed the glass in a single blow. Unfortunately, it made one hell of a racket, and I was really lucky not to have cut myself. As I entered the building and looked around, I realized that the antibiotics I so desperately needed would be kept in the back of the shop, so I carefully made my way towards the counter. Just in front of it, I noticed a body wearing what appeared to be a white lab coat. It was probably the chemist. From the blood stain and bullet hole in his back, I surmised that he had been shot to death. I carefully walked around the body and headed for the back room. No point wasting time. As I walked into the back room, my heart sank. While the front of the shop had been left untouched, looters had clearly broken in at the back and taken all the medicine. Most likely, drug addicts in search of a fix. I searched everywhere, but the only thing left was a few tubes of hemorrhoid cream. I made my way back to the front of the shop and realized that my mission was far from over. I wondered if I could find any extra supplies before continuing. I realized that a place like this probably sold some basic first aid kits and equipment. It didn't take long to find what I was after. I put it in my backpack and then headed back outside. I pressed on towards the local mall. It was the only other place in town that I knew for sure had a pharmacy. There may have been other places, but I didn't know where they were, and didn't want to risk getting eaten alive while looking for something that might not exist. As the mall finally came into view, I felt a strange mix of relief and horror. I was now close to my goal, but it seemed that the last few hundred yards would pose an almost insurmountable problem. The plaza in front of the building was infested with zombies, idly wandering in circles and occasionally bumping into each other. As I wondered what to do next, the wind suddenly changed direction, carrying my scent toward the pack of infected. In near perfect unison, the infected sniffed the air and turned to stare directly at me. A split second later, they charged. I knew I didn't stand a chance against the oncoming mob of post-human cannibals. 
rifles, so I turned on my heels and fled as quickly as I could. The infected were surprisingly fast on their feet, but luckily they struggled to avoid the mass of abandoned vehicles and debris that covered the road. I was able to lose most of them by running around the block, and those that still followed were quite a distance behind me. As I returned to the plaza, I realized that not many of the zombies had chased me as I had originally thought. Unable to reach the main entrance, and with the infected now approaching from all sides, I had no choice but to run down a small side alley. There was still a single doorway into the mall, and luckily it was still unlocked. I slammed the door shut behind me. It seemed reasonably strong and was small enough to prevent large numbers of infected from pushing against it all at once. Still, leaving it as it was definitely posed a risk. I closed the bolts on the door and then quickly looked around for something to barricade it. Luckily there were some old tables and chairs nearby, which I was easily able to wedge in front of the entrance. No one would be getting in or out this way anytime soon. Now that I was reasonably sure that the infected wouldn't be getting into the building the same way I did, my attention turned to my new surroundings. I was in a long hallway with several storage rooms on either side. From the vague odor of damp and chemicals, I realized this was obviously some kind of basement used primarily by the cleaning staff. I could see a stairwell leading up to the main building at the end of the hall. I carefully explored the various side rooms, making sure that none of the infected had made a home here. Fortunately, this part of the building was empty but I soon realized that some of the rooms posed a serious problem for security. Several of the windows had been smashed in the chaos following the outbreak. Since I didn't have the time or resources to block up every one, I instead closed all the interior doors and wedged chairs under the handles. I climbed the flight of stairs to the ground floor and then headed through a small doorway into the main building. The mall was eerily quiet and despite my best efforts to keep a low profile, every footstep seemed to echo throughout the entire building. The shutters on most stores had been closed, presumably in an attempt to keep the infected from roaming freely. Frequent bloodstains were an ever-present reminder of how little the shopkeepers had achieved. A sickening feeling in my gut told me this place had been the scene of a terrible massacre. As I slowly made my way to the central square, I recalled that the pharmacy was up on the second floor. I could see no signs of life, human or otherwise, and so decided to ascend the nearest escalator and secure the medicine the folks back at the farm so desperately needed. Before I could reach it, the silence was broken by a tremendous bang, swiftly followed by something whizzing an inch past my head. Someone had taken a shot at me. immediately dove for the nearest pillar as several more bullets were fired. Amazingly, I wasn't hit. The pillar offered temporary respite from my assailants, but it would only be a matter of time before they outflanked me. I couldn't see them, but I could hear them maneuvering on the floor above. I had to act fast if I was to have any chance of survival. I realized that they had me totally pinned down and that my chances of surviving a firefight were slim. My only hope was to try and convince them to let me live. I cried, I'm not infected, as loud as I could. There was a pause, followed by a voice full of fear and doubt. Prove it. He ordered me to put my gun on the ground and step slowly out from behind the pillar with my hands up. I could see no alternative, and so I reluctantly did what I was told. As I stood defenseless in the open, I explained that I hadn't been bitten, and that I meant them no harm. The survivors whispered among themselves for a moment, before one of them asked me to take off my clothes so they could see for themselves. I undressed and a man armed with a shotgun came down to inspect me. Finally satisfied that I wasn't about to eat them, the man asked me why I was here. I 
decided it was best if I told the survivors the truth from the beginning. They'd probably find out sooner or later anyway. As I put my clothes back on and picked up my equipment, I explained all about the fortified farm, the disease that plagued my family, and my quest for antibiotics. They seemed impressed by my bravery and allowed me to join them on the second floor. As I climbed the escalator, I realized just how wise my decision to surrender had been. There were at least 20 survivors in the building, with over half of them armed with shotguns or rifles. The rest had an assortment of vicious-looking melee weapons. As soon as I reached the top, I was directed toward their leader, a tall and muscular African-American who introduced himself as Ox. Ox told me that if I wanted his help and protection, or at least to be allowed to roam his mall freely, I had to earn it. Apparently there was no longer any power in the mall, and he wanted someone to head down to the basement and turn on the generator. The last man he sent never came back. I told him I'd be happy to help, but that I desperately needed some more equipment if I was going to survive. He grudgingly agreed and got one of his lackeys to hand over some ammo. I was then informed that I'd be taking a mechanic named Smith along with me, partly to fix the generator if it needed it, and partly to make sure I didn't try anything stupid. Smith and I went back down the escalator and through the door I had originally come through to the stairwell. We headed back down, and then Smith pointed out another doorway hidden under the stairs that I hadn't noticed before. I carefully opened the door with my gun at the ready. Ox obviously thought this place was dangerous, so I kept my guard up. On the other side of the door it was pitch black. If there were any windows they were small, and the curtains or blinds were closed. We listened carefully for any signs of the infected, but heard nothing. We weren't about to proceed without a light source, but luckily Smith had a few matches on him. We lit one and slowly made our way into the room. The match didn't offer much illumination, but it was enough to make our way to the generator without making any undue noise. We reached the generator. Smith promptly pulled a lever and pressed a few buttons. Apparently getting the thing up and running was as simple as that, because it immediately sprang to life. The lights in the room flashed and came on, and just in time. Our activities had disturbed a small group of infected who had been lurking in a side room, and they were now rushing toward us. I opened fire and was easily able to gun the bastards down. I breathed a sigh of relief and turned to Smith, but to my horror he was lying on the floor, bleeding heavily. In the confusion I had accidentally shot him in the leg. I knew Smith didn't have a lot of time, so I quickly removed the first aid kit from my backpack and got to work. I used a tourniquet to staunch the bleeding and then bandaged the wound. It wasn't much, but it was the best I could do. I helped him to his feet, and we headed back to the group. When we reached the stairwell, we were greeted by a terrifying noise. All the gunfire and now the bright lights of the mall had attracted a large group of infected who were trying to get in any way they could. Luckily, I had securely barricaded this area when I first entered the building. It wouldn't hold them for long, but it brought us enough time to get back to the group. By the time we got back to the group, they were already celebrating. Now the power was back on and they were focused on making the most of it while it lasted. Several had gotten one of the coffee shops up and running and were busy preparing hot food and drinks. Others were setting up a games console to entertain themselves while not on guard duty. Knowing about the threat from downstairs, it wasn't particularly... It wasn't particularly reassuring. Smith had lost a lot of blood and was barely conscious when we arrived. Once I told them he had been shot, not bitten, Ox ordered some of the few women among the survivors to take care of him. There was no time to relax. The infected would be inside very soon, and if we weren't prepared, we'd be overrun in minutes. Before I could even finish explaining the situation, Ox was barking orders at his men. 
getting them into the best position to deal with the threat. They were only just in time. Suddenly, the basement door burst open, and a seemingly unstoppable horde of infected zombies charged through. The first wave was gunned down before they reached the escalator, but more and more of them just kept on coming. Every gun in the building was blazing while survivors armed with clubs and axes struggled to keep the tide of monsters from climbing the stairs. I had no idea if we'd be able to fight them off or not. I knew there was no way we'd be able to fight off the infected horde. My thoughts turned once again to my dying wife, and I realized that this might be my last chance to secure the antibiotics she so desperately needed. While the others held the infected at bay, I ran as fast as I could for the pharmacy. It took me less than a minute to reach the former drugstore. It had been totally untouched by looters, and all the various medicines were readily available. I could still hear the battle raging behind me, and I knew that I didn't have much time. Unfortunately, I wasn't alone. It seemed that the infected had found another way into the building and several of them were now shambling straight toward me. They sprang immediately into action, jumping up to grab the bottom of the heavy iron shutters and pulling them down before the infected could get inside. I was only just in time. Had I have taken just one more second to lock them in place, I would have been devoured for sure. Now that I had the luxury of time, I thoroughly searched the pharmacy for the antibiotics I needed. I filled my backpack with as much of the stuff as I could, and then made my way out of the shop through the back door. I found myself in some sort of staff-only area that would normally have been off-limits to the general public. There were corridors leading to various offices and storage areas behind the back of the shops, but I had no time for sightseeing. I followed the signs and headed straight for the stairs. As I turned a corner I heard a scream and the sounds of a struggle. One of the female survivors had also tried to make an escape, but had been ambushed by one of the infected. She had dropped her pistol and was now struggling to keep the monster from biting her. I couldn't get a clean shot at the zombie, so I resorted to wrestling the creature off of her. Amazingly, my plan worked and I was able to drag the infected away from the poor girl, allowing her to grab her gun and make her escape. Unfortunately, during the struggle, the beast managed to bite my arm, and even though I eventually managed to smash its skull on a fire extinguisher, I was still doomed. As I slowly succumbed to the infection, I felt a slight twinge of pride. I had sacrificed myself for the life of another. By the this was no time for chivalry. I left the girl to die and ran to the stairs. As I reached the stairwell, I became all too aware that the sound of gunfire, a constant companion for the last few minutes, had suddenly stopped. Had the survivors fought off the infected, or had they all been wiped out? I had no way of knowing either way. I wasn't going to risk heading back to the group. In my heart, I knew they were all dead, and either way I needed to get home to save my wife. I ran up the stairs, out of the fire escape, and onto the roof. I stepped out into the open air and breathed a sigh of relief. I was on the top level of a multi-story car park which seemed to be blessedly free of zombies. There were also plenty of parked cars in relatively good condition, perfect for a swift and safe ride home. I suddenly noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I span round and took aim, expecting it to be one of the infected. To my relief and surprise, it was a handful of survivors who had managed to escape the carnage downstairs. Before I could meet up with them, something leaped at me from the shadows, knocking my gun from my hands and nearly pushing me to the floor. I regained my balance just in time to defend myself from the creature's next assault.
zombie ran forward. I grabbed it by the neck with both hands. Realizing he'd be unable to bite me, I pushed him back with all my might, forcing him toward the railings. It took every ounce of strength that I had remaining, but I managed to shove the infected bastard over the edge. A few seconds later, I heard a sickening splat as his body hit the ground. Now that the immediate danger had been dealt with, I had to decide how best to get back to the ground floor. As I picked up my gun, I took another look around. There were plenty of parked cars that I could steal, and the other survivors had already begun hot-wiring an SUV. I decided that my best bet was to join up with the other survivors. They seemed pleased to see another living human, and were totally overjoyed when I told them I had somewhere safe to go. Since I was the only one who knew the way, they let me drive. As we made our way down to the car park, we realized just how fortunate we had been. The place was crawling with infected, and there was no way we could have escaped on foot. I sped out of the car park, breaking through the wooden barrier and skidding out onto the main road. I chose the most direct route I could think of, back toward the compound, and drove as fast as I could. I didn't get far though. Not more than two blocks down the street, I came across the remains of a serious traffic accident. Several vehicles blockaded the road. couldn't see how we would get any further in the car, so we resolved to complete our journey on foot. The others seemed reluctant to leave the vehicle, but without somewhere to go, they had no reason to drive off on their own. We climbed over the crashed cars and began the long walk home. We didn't get far. A few blocks down the road, we encountered a massive crowd of the infected, and though we tried to run, we were too exhausted to escape our pursuers. One by one, we were run down and ripped to shreds. It was risky, but I had to clear a path somehow. I jumped out of the car and began to push the other vehicles out of the way. Luckily, the previous owners had not bothered to put the brakes on before abandoning their vehicles, so it was relatively easy to roll them out of the way. Once I had cleared a path, I jumped back inside and drove off. As I looked down the road ahead of me, I realized that making my escape might not be as easy as I first thought. A huge mob of infected assembled on the street ahead. I wasn't going to risk driving through a ravenous horde of the infected unnecessarily. I turned off down a small back road and took another route back to the compound. It was a little more time-consuming, but a lot less suicidal. I finally made it out of the town and back to the countryside. The sun was setting in the distance behind me. I had been through a lot that day and was glad that I would soon be reunited with my loving wife. Just when I thought I was out of danger, the engine began to make strange clunking noises. I prayed that it would last until I got home, but God didn't seem to be listening. I had no hope of fixing the problem, and it was far too dangerous to waste time trying. The compound was only an hour's walk or so away, so I abandoned the vehicle and resolved to carry on on foot. After a long and terrifying walk through the gloom of twilight, I finally arrived at my father-in-law's compound. I was mentally and physically exhausted and wanted nothing more than to crawl into bed, cuddle up to my wife, and fall into a deep sleep. I was expecting a far warmer welcome than I received. Despite my heroic efforts on their behalf, the guards wisely insisted that my companions and I prove we hadn't been bitten before being allowed in. Once more I had to strip down to my skin to show that I would remain among the living. With the formalities over and done with, we were finally allowed inside. As soon as the gates were safely closed behind me, my father-in-law ran out from the farmhouse and uncharacteristically gave me a hug. 
Then he asked me about the medicine. I smiled and showed him the contents of my backpack. I had secured enough antibiotics to treat everyone who lived in the compound, myself included. We wasted no time in delivering them to everyone who needed it. Over the course of the next few days, the compound began to recover. With the exception of the two worst cases, everyone survived the illness and were soon back on their feet. Most importantly of all, I had saved my beautiful wife yet again.